This week on The Futurists, Gert Leonhard. I, I would say, I, I personally believe that direct democracy, as we are practicing it here in Switzerland, has a lot of advantages, but it's not really fit for the future. Welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Rob Tursik with my co-host, Brett King. Hey. And this week, we're going to be talking to an old friend and longtime futurist, Gerrit Leonhardt. But before we jump into that, let me do the news. This week in the future, there's some updates on some stories that we covered in previous episodes of The Futurists, including this one. Uh, so recently, we spoke a little bit about the role that Elon Musk's Starlink from SpaceX has played a decisive role in the Ukrainian conflict. Mm. Uh, but news broke today that um, SpaceX can't continue to pay for that indefinitely. After his call with Putin. Yes. Very and suspect. also after uh, after a series of, of messages on Twitter that weren't particularly flattering about Musk and Tesla and so forth on the Ukrainian side. Uh, so he's letting people know that he can't continue to pay for that. Then that, that service has played a decisive role in battlefield communications, but also keeping hospitals and other um, other key facilities online in the Ukraine during the conflict. So watch this space. Uh, he's asking the United States to subsidize it to the tune of about $20 million a month. One of the things he pointed out is that the Russians continue to try to hack the Starlink network, and they've been fairly successful in the sense that they've forced Starlink to continuously rewrite that software, uh, but they've been resilient so far. Another story we've been talking about in the past is uh, NFTs and cryptocurrency, always a lively topic. Now, the general assumption there is that that, uh, that field is dead and done for because of the big crypto crash. But longtime crypto fans know that it always kind of comes back. It's like Lazarus. It you just can't kill it. Um, so this week, a watchdog group, a consumer watchdog group called Truth in Advertising sent notices to 17 celebrities warning them about shilling NFTs in social media without disclosing that they're getting paid. So as it turns out, if you're dropping an NFT, uh, you'll tend to give a few to some celebrity who gets out there and flogs it for you on Instagram and other social sites. Um, unfortunately, this is against the law and you do have to disclose that if you're getting paid. So those notices went out to music celebrities like Eminem, Drake, DJ Khaled, and sports figures like Shaquille O'Neal and Tom Brady, and other celebrities, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, Madonna, Paris Hilton, TV host Jimmy Fallon, wow. and of course, Logan Paul, because Logan Paul, if there's some, yeah. something bad or mischievous going on, he's probably going to be involved in it in some way. Uh, that's an interesting thing, story because that's a first step uh, before they escalate to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, so this shows that the United States government is starting to pay attention to cryptocurrencies in ways where they're, they're trying to keep it under control. And we've seen uh, kind of an ever-evolving regulatory regimen from the, federal, from the uh, SEC which has caused a lot of consternation here. And Garrett, when we get into it in a moment, I want to talk a little bit about crypto in Switzerland because it's generally perceived that the United States has such a chaotic regulatory landscape here. It's actually thwarting the progress of the development there. But then one other thing, I want to follow up on a story, Brett, that you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, which is that NASA asteroid test. Uh, folks will recall that NASA crashed a uh, spacecraft into an the asteroid. Dark mission. That's right. And, uh, and the asteroid is called Dimorphos. Well, that mission was considered to be successful in the sense that they actually shifted the course of the uh, asteroid. And so um, the head of By NASA, 32 minutes, yeah, which is the arc of... That's right. Not, not 32 minutes of time, but that's uh, <laughs> the direction. But apparently that, that impact uh, is, is three times greater than what they had projected. So it was considered a big success. And One uh, other thing is Dimorphos has now um, formed a tail. Well, that Which just happened was since about the impact. Say. Yep, yep. You, you, you upcut the Sorry, payout dude. There, Brett. Thanks for jumping on me. Sorry. So uh, NASA's head, uh, Bill Nelson, took a victory lap uh, and said that NASA has proven we are a serious defender of the planet, which seems a little grandiose, but it is an awesome achievement to smash a, a spacecraft into an asteroid, except for the trail that you mentioned. This is a trail that is 10,000 kilometers of debris scattered through space. And of course, that's going to continue to expand forever. So three quick stories from the top. Q and now, Aerosmith. Let's, right. <laughs> let's get into our show. So let's talk to our guest futurist this week, old friend, Garrett Lanhart. Garrett, it's good to see you again. It's been a long he, he's, time. He doesn't look that old. No, but. You know, he, he looks in good shape, good, does he? I remember. It's a good life to do that. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you coming from today, Gerd? Yeah, I'm actually in Zurich in my, in okay. my studio, and right. I'm home for once, you know, so not bad. Awesome. 
And how are things in, in Switzerland uh, now that the pandemic is sort of under control, or at least people claim it is? We'll see what happens. Um, are things returning to normal? Yeah. Things are somewhat returning to normal. I think a lot of people are still worried about big events or traveling too much or... You know, as Swiss people tend to be much more shielded from the from the rest of the world because of our exclusive status. You know, we only have two point five percent inflation, for example, uh, and you know the country is run very very democratically with all these direct elections. And awesome. so Switzerland is a bit of an island in so many ways. Yeah, but Switzerland is, it doesn't mean Switzerland is entirely conservative because, as I mentioned in the opening bit there, uh, in terms of cryptocurrency. Switzerland is one of the jurisdictions in the world that's at the very forefront of innovation. Uh, you know, you can now uh, start an organization. You can start a decentralized uh, autonomous organization in Switzerland. You can um, you can capitalize it with cryptocurrency and so forth. Uh, that's far ahead of most other places, including most of the United States. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that, because it seems to me the way I look at that is that the Swiss are taking a very pragmatic approach to the future. We're the Senji. We're a banking center. This is a financial <laughs> technology. We need to be on top of it. We're not going to stop it, so we might as well embrace it. What, what's your take on that? Did I, did I get it right, or am I just being idealistic? Well, you know, I'm I'm a Swiss citizen. I live here for I don't know 15 years, but I I you know I I'm also a German citizen, so I became a Swiss citizen. And I think Switzerland, in many ways, is uh, a place where technological achievement and anything to do with money is on the forefront of things. Behavior change and stuff no like here people have gadgets that do things but they don't change behavior very easily for example now everybody is being asked to go back to the office okay that's because in switzerland you go to the office you can bond with the boss and you move up in the world right uh and it's it, it's that is very uh, not conservative in the sense but uh not very fast in changing behavior the cryptocurrency thing has been mostly to uh, out of the fear of losing out on a new global market that has to do with cryptocurrencies. But of course, everybody knows what's happening uh, in that regard is that, you know, we're looking probably at uh, um, central bank digital currencies rather than independent currencies and peer-to-peer and -peer like Bitcoin. And the Swiss government is, is of course, very cautious on that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think we're going to see plans here for central bank digital currency from Switzerland possibly a new kind of stock market and those kind of things. But anything that's pragmatic, I think, and money-oriented works here. Anything that's really risk-taking, mm, yeah, that 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 takes longer. You know, we don't change behavior very easily here. Hey, tell me about the distinction between Germany and Switzerland. I used to live in Germany, and, you know, I'm, I'm fond of the place. I'm still interested to hear about that. But but you uh, you chose to move to Switzerland. What's I, I, I've got a good joke about, I got a good joke about the Swiss versus the German. <laughs> The, the Swiss are mm -hmm. like the Germans, but without the sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. You know, well, in Switzerland, you know, we speak German here, but it's not a regular German. It's Swiss German completely. It's different. high German, right? That's, you, yeah. No. Uh, it's That's what I speak, and, and the Swiss people have five or six different types of yeah. Swiss German, which is actually only a spoken language. It's not even written, right? So you can't write Swiss German. You can, but nobody does. So the Swiss Germans speak Swiss German, but they write regular German. Right? And they, the biggest difference is that in Germany, people are primarily perfectionists and engineers, and uh, you know they want to make things better, uh, what they already have. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, it's much more about not taking risks. Hmm. So being independent, uh, having your own way of doing things, being federalistic, that is a very, very big thing here. In many ways, Switzerland is a paradise as a result, but also kind of a an island, right? Hmm. So, for example, we have all the international organizations, the UN, the WIPO, the FIFA here, but we're not going to do anything international that would upset anybody else like like the Americans, right? Um, like starting something that would be, for example, our own data center, which we, we could easily do. Uh, that we leave that to Luxembourg and Austria to uh, get their fingers burned on the data center. But, you know, we do a lot of things that are primarily kind of shoring up against risk. And, and that is uh, the primary thing that is sometimes makes it hard in Switzerland to innovate because risk taking is left to others. Mm -hmm. And it's really just the sort of watch perfection of watches, right? But but Switzerland, you know, the Swiss watch companies would never invent the Apple Watch, of course. Right. Uh, they would only react once Apple does it, and the result is that Apple sells 
10x as many watches as, yeah. as all of the Swiss watch companies together. It's interesting you bring that up because I remember really clearly um, when Apple introduced the watch around 2014, uh, I had a very lively discussion with people who are in the fashion and apparel industry. And they said, it's never going to work. It's going to be dead on arrival. You know, the, Tim Cook is not Steve Jobs. He's never going to pull this off. He'll, he won't be successful. I and mean, they went on and on. And you even had like, you know, the head of LMVH saying uh, that the Apple Watch was poorly designed and it was ugly and it didn't have any appeal. It's uh, the the resistance from the traditional accessory and, and jewelry and, um, you know, luxury market was incredibly negative and pessimistic. And, uh, you know, yeah, only, they've all co-opted it, you know, well, it only took a couple of years before, yeah. before Apple managed to first outsell most major, you know, Swiss watchmakers and then all of Switzerland. Right. And it's become this kind of global home run. How is that perceived? Like, what was the reaction in Switzerland? Did people, were people angry? Were they disappointed? Were they, you know, self-critical? What was the reaction there? Well, you know, the reality is that Swiss people are still doing really well with their watches. You know, we we just don't have the Chinese coming anymore and buying five Rolexes, you know, because they couldn't come for a long time. And now they're buying fancy Apple watches, but they're still buying Swiss watches, too. Um, and so the uh, the perception in Switzerland is very much like Switzerland is on, on the way of becoming more connected, more international, probably less isolated. That's happening. It's a huge political thing here. And you have to get, remember that Switzerland, otherwise, is a true paradise. You can walk out and, and put your wallet on a park bench and come back the next day and somebody yeah. will have re reported it and brought you the money, you know? Wow. Uh, yeah. And there's no crime here, almost no crime. There is a very high level of income, a super safe protection, direct democracy, you know? So so a lot of these things are very well worth keeping, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I but, find you know, that... you can't have the cake and eat it. I find that interesting in that, um, you know, if, if we look at economies like the US and the UK, um, you know, that are particularly divided politically, you know, you, you, you are now, the more division politically you have, especially when it comes to policy and things like that, the more dysfunctional, you know, you, you seem to have. Uh, get in terms of bureaucracy and things like that. But when it comes to um, some of the big issues we're facing, artificial intelligence, uh, climate change, you know, we're going to be required to get to a consensus point, you know, to be successful at, at tackling these things. So what is it that drives that, that consensus mechanism in Switzerland that's so successful? Because obviously there's still political conflict there, but they're pretty good at resolving it, it would appear. I would say, I personally believe that direct democracy, as we are practicing it here in Switzerland, has a lot of advantages, but it's not really fit for the future, right? Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, you know, we have 3 million people in Switzerland who live in the mountains who vote against anything that is progressive, whatever it is, right? Uh, and now we have to tackle climate change. We have to look at AI. We have to look at automation. We have to look at genetic engineering. Are we right, going to right. get those people to vote? To vote? No. You know, right. and, and Switzerland is in desperate need for action on climate change. Our glaciers are melting. Mm. And, exactly. You know, the majority exactly. of people doesn't want to do much about it, right? So I, I think this is really a big problem here is that uh, sometimes we even have laws where then there's groups, you know, starting a referendum and then they go back on the, on the law that has already been enacted, mm. right? Uh, and, you know, it's all kind of nice to have that as a principle of really strong democracy. But we have urgent press, pressing issues that are not being looked at. Uh, and I, I think that is a really, really hard thing to do when you have people voting on everything. Every three months, we get a, a stack of voting material, you know. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in Switzerland is that we are we are a very stable, very, very uh, calm and quiet society, but we don't have a future focus at all. Mm. You know, uh, so, like, I mean, is, I, do you yeah. find yourself spending a lot of time trying to educate people? I mean, is this part of what drives you as a futurist? Good. Yes, I do. I mean, I try to work with the government. I, you know, I'm a foreigner here uh, still, regardless of the passport. I'm more of a foreigner here than I ever was in America. Uh, where I didn't have a passport. Uh, that's because I just say one word in German and I know I'm not Swiss, right? Um, and and so I, I work a lot. I try to work with the government to be more forward-looking. But if you remember in the book, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's amazing book, The Ministry, Ministry of, of the, the Future, Future. Yep. right? That That is actually here in Zurich. Exactly. In the ministry on yeah, the, yeah. the Hochstrasse, which is 100 feet from here. 
where I stand now. But Switzerland would never, ever dare to do such a thing, right? Because a ministry like this would be highly contentious and highly mingling with all kinds of things, right? And I always and, say and that yet Switzerland in... would make the perfect place for it because of its neutrality, right? Right, right. But I, I live. We live in a country without our courage like this. We don't have the courage, right? And that is, if you don't have courage, you don't look at the future because the future may be scary, right? Uh, so, and that that desperately has to change. So, so then, would you characterize that the the things like like the initiatives in cryptocurrency that I described earlier? Are those just defensive innovation? Are they just a way to protect what Switzerland's got and not lose it? Uh, you know, not not slip in the world standing. Is that what you're saying? Basically, you have a city right here over the hill called Zug, Z U G, Zug, yeah. which is the center of cryptocurrency in Europe, really. And basically, what the the city has said: anybody moving here with a startup in crypto, we have we make a great deal, right? This is a defensive move move against losing the financial uh, center of of uh, the world being in Switzerland, right? Interesting. But you know, it's mostly sort of just kind of uh, you know, it's it's a little bit like, yeah, it's showing stuff, but not actually much doing much about it, right? right. Um, and not really making a decisive step. Step like you know, starting a ministry for the future, an international organization that would be courageous and needed and ballsy. Right. Uh, and okay. that would be quite different than starting a bunch of uh, crypto companies in Zook. True. Okay, but, but what people are thinking right now when they hear you say this, they're going to probably think, wait a minute. These guys are talking to a futurist who's based in Switzerland, and that's a choice that he made. He moved from, from Germany to Switzerland. But yet what Garrett's saying right now is it's it, it, not is an it innovative cool? place. Why on earth would you pick that? No, no, place? no. It, no, it's actually uh, Switzerland is very innovative on practical things like you know, better chocolate, right, better water, right. better cheese, uh, and 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 a great ETH. The universities are great on this, but reinventing and actually doing what is most urgently needed right now, which is a reboot, right? Yeah. Rebooting financial systems, rebooting food, rebooting uh, education, right? That is very difficult here because rebooting is just hard, right? Okay, so tell uh, for, us about for tell the us mentality. about how you do that. You you obviously have a well developed philosophy here. How did you arrive at that? What is your what is your futurist methodology? How do you arrive at the initiatives that you get excited about and want to support? Yeah, you know, I spent 20 years on this now, and the beginning was mostly about technology and digital transformation because it was also new, you know, explaining the tech to people. But after I did that for 10 years, and I've done, you know, almost 2,000 speaking gigs, and I work with the top Fortune 500 companies, I realized that, you know, the... The real story here is not just the financial and the business part and the tech part. Uh, that is actually very obvious now. Uh, the real part is like, what kind of world do we actually want with all the tech that we have? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now I say, basically, we have all the tech and science we can possibly ask for, and we're getting new stuff every week. But what we're missing is the the purpose, right? the telos, the intelligence, the the collaboration to solve the true problems it's not a question of tech, right? So five years ago, I started shifting towards this topic of technology, humanity, the future in a larger way, right? Which is primarily about policy and about making the right decisions and being future fit, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I call it people, planet, purpose, and prosperity, the, the paradigm, right? Um, and so that you developed this framework. You, you developed a framework, uh, planet, purpose, and prosperity. And that was part of your your tech yeah. versus humanity framing, but now you're starting something. Right. Now you're the founder of a new project, right? It's called the the Good Future Project. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? I like that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, two years ago I made a film called The Good Future, mm -hmm. and it's shot in Lanzarote, Canary Islands, and uh, you can see it at thegoodfuturefilm.com, um, and it's quite popular. And it's basically saying, like, look, the future is not as bad as it looks. Right now, most people have a bad view on the future, right? Pandemics, yeah. AI, automation, Putin, Erdogan, you know, story goes on. Uh, it's not looking good. If I ask my kids about the future, you know what they say? Said so the good future is all BS, right? There is no such thing as the good future. Hmm. And they're millennials, right? So I made this film to say to people, look, the future is good. All we have to do is to get some wisdom about what we're doing here. Because uh, we can use AI, for example, to bring down pollution and those kind of things by 50, 60, 70 percent, like in agriculture and, and food, right? 
but we could also use it to be to build super soldiers. You know? So mm-hmm. we right. we need to have the right wisdom, and that is what's missing. So I can't, okay. I I basically uh, started the Good Future Project as a way of getting together with hundreds of people who are telling stories about what the good future could look like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're, the goal is to make films about this. This is one of the key goals because films are a great medium. And to create events, both online as well as uh, events. Uh, think of something like Burning Man plus Ted plus Davos. Nice. You know, then you would have the good the good future uh, festival. That's not too ambitious. <laughs> uh, okay. No, so not at all. You know. This is at thegoodfuture.com. We uh, we, uh, the, we should the, definitely the, talk to you about the Futurists conference series we're trying yeah, to put together as well. That's so. right. But uh, now it's, it's the time. Pro- Thegoodfutureproject.com. Oh, thegoodfutureproject.com. Right? Okay, yeah. great. So uh, we will definitely come back to this topic after the break. But before we do that, it's time for our quick series of questions. This is the lightning round. Brett, take it away. All right, good. Um, here's here's a few uh, quick questions for you. What was the first science fiction you remember being exposed to? TV books. That uh, was the, the, definitely Blade Runner, 1982, critical. when I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is really something that changes my life, my perspective. Cool. Um, is there a specific technology you think that has most benefited or changed humanity? Well, I I would say that's definitely a cognitive computing, intelligent machines. Uh, that uh, well, I think it has the potential to be mostly positive. Yeah, absolutely. so uh, that's definitely number one. It can it can solve many problems for us, and and the next one would be really uh, sustainable energy and you know solar and all that kind of innovation that we see there. Great, we might get into a bit more of that later. Um, name a futurist or um, entrepreneur um, that has influenced you and why. Oh God, there are a lot. I think the the biggest influence really would be Buckminster Fuller, hmm. you know, the the designer, and you know, who basically said that you know we, we're inventing all the right technology, but we're using it for the wrong reasons. <laughs> and uh, you know, that was sixty years ago. And of course, along with that, Marshall McLuhan and Alvin Toffler and people like yeah. that. Entrepreneurs, I really admire what Bill Gates has done. I know he's sometimes not so popular with people because of his uh, enormous. Uh, uh, how can I say output, right? <laughs> um, but uh, he is amazing, and uh, so and he's very much a futurist as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, can you can you identify a specific prediction that an entrepreneur, a futurist, or a science fiction uh, practitioner has made that has has been particularly prescient? Um, I would say, <laughs> well, I, I guess I could quote my own. You know, in, in 1999, I said, music will move to the cloud and become like water. Awesome. Like, uh, you know, and uh, I got influenced by David Bowie, who said something of, of that yeah. sort, you know, a few years before. Right. And uh, on the opposite side, I would say that people have said that we're going to see self driving cars in 2020 and we're still not seeing them. So uh, the opposite is also true. Yeah. And finally, uh, what science fiction story is most representative of the future you hope for? Yeah, I would say uh, Kim Stanley Robinson again, yeah. the Ministry for the Future, because it's basically 2030, but it feels like it's now. Yeah. Uh, and he has actually a positive ending, <laughs> uh, does, which is yeah. extremely hopeful. And, and so it's just brilliant. Also, all the stuff he puts forth there is actually very much oriented towards solutions. Yeah, in fact, he's written a whole series of science fiction climate focused books, and of course, uh, he yeah. does the Mar- he did the Mars trilogy, which I think it, you know my position is is the greatest um, series on the colonization of Mars that's ever been written. But we'd love to have him on the show. We're, we're going to try and get him on. So, all right, well, listen, let's take a quick break. You're listening to the Futurists. Uh, um, with Brett King and my co-host, Rob Tersek. We're talking to Gerd Leonhard this week. We'll be right back after these uh, quick words from our sponsors. Provoke Media is proud to sponsor, produce, and support the Futurist podcast. Provoke.fm is a global podcast network and content creation company with the world's leading fintech podcast and radio show, Breaking Banks. And of course, it's spin-off podcasts, Breaking Banks Europe, Breaking Banks Asia Pacific, and the Fintech Five. But we also produce the official Finnovate podcast, Tech on Reg, 
Emerge Everywhere, the podcast of the Financial Health Network and NextGen Banker. For information about all our podcasts, go to provoke.fm or check out Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. Welcome back to The Futurists. I'm Brett King, your host with Rob Tersek. And uh, in the hot seat today, we're interviewing Gerd Leinhard. But f- before we uh, jump back into that, I just thought uh, I'd do a quick deep dive on some of the updates um, that are happening in gene therapy. Um, you know, we have some gene therapy treatments that are actually, you know, getting some pretty big traction right now. Um, there's a possible cure for sickle cell anemia. Um, We have uh, gene editing boosting the effectiveness of uh, cancer therapies, Um, gene therapy being used to improve night vision. These are gene therapies um, that are already in in, uh, trial around the world. Um, So, of course, uh, you know, sort of a simple uh, overview of what gene therapy is, is the ability to use technologies like uh, CRISPR, uh, TAS9, other, other uh, gene editing techniques to actually change protein switches in your genome, in your g- DNA. So think of it like editing out a bad software bug in terms of specific diseases or conditions. But we've made rapid progress in this, not only using CRISPR to splice uh, um, genes or splice DNA, but we're now learning more about how um, we can switch proteins on and off for certain conditions. A interesting uh, research paper came out uh, in April earlier this year um, from WEHI researchers, um, which was that when you when we're looking at um, adjusting specific genes in the genome, there's an accordion effect. There's various genes that work together. And so we're learning how, when it comes to uh, gene silencing, which is if you've got, say, a gene that is dominantly uh, involved in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or these other genetic conditions, silencing those genes or turning those proteins off um, are going to be, uh, obviously, this is the, 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 part of the research that we're really um, going after. But to enable this, um, these researchers came up with this system called Xmas, based on red and green tags and are normally switched off during development. And we were ab- they were able to uh, uh, learn different gene activity from different chromosomes um, using this sort of gre- red and green fluorescence um, on the proteins to reveal how gene silencing process was occurring in, um, in relation to different proteins working together. So if we're going to tackle specific conditions, it's not just a single gene that we're looking at. We're going to be having to look at how how we can stimulate various genes at the same time. And it looks like we're making significant progress on this front. But gene therapy, um, you know, we have some uh, traction on uh, some of those specific um, uh, diseases or conditions that are already becoming operational. uh, uh, Gene therapy for high cholesterol has been put in place. We see many cancers being tackled using gene therapy. We've uh, seen various types of leukemia and other things like this tackled now with this. But we're making some really interesting progress. So it's very uh, positive. Who knows, in 15 to 20 years, maybe you'll just be able to go in for your regular gene checkup and have your genes adjusted. Uh, you know. And of course, this does parallel with the whole longevity thing as well. So yeah. with cell senescence and you know telomeres and all of that working concert could be very interesting times. This will be a topic we'll certainly be returning to. Uh, a lot of folks think this, this is going to be the century of synthetic biology or programmable biology where you program a cell just the way you'd program a computer. So super fun, thanks for that update. Uh, It is kind of amazing as we get deeper and deeper into these systems, what we discover is the immense complexity. In other words, we keep uncovering more and more layers of complexity, how these different genes interact with each other. Um, It's a little bit like uh, the study of the brain and, um, and, and trying to understand consciousness and memory because as we start to peer into the brain structure, we start to see again, uh, layers and layers of complexity. Uh, and it's, it's like, you know, it's the imaging, it's the advancements in imaging technologies and the advancements in computing that have obviously enabled us to make this progress. I wonder if we, uh, if we underestimate just how complex these systems are, you know, when we're mucking about with turning on and off um, different genes, um, my sense is that there's going to probably be some unexpected, 
Yeah. yeah unexpected side effects, maybe unintentional Agreed. consequences and so forth. Uh, is this a topic that's widely debated in Switzerland in your part of the world? Tell me, Garrett, is uh, the gene therapy something that people have embraced or are the people skeptical? Well, here in Switzerland, of course, we have all the big pharma companies who are here looking mm -hmm. at this issue. And I've done some work on the on those topics with some of them. I think in generally the the idea of uh, doing that without really knowing what comes out on the other end is uh, frowned upon here. Um, there's a lot of uh, precaution that people want to apply. I mean, I think there's a difference between uh, affecting the germline, which is, you know, changing the genome that can be inherited on. That's completely different than actually changing my only my mm -hmm. uh, genome in the sense of fighting a symptom. You know, so I may die as a result, but it's just me, and I probably would have died anyway if if it's going to be so serious, right? Right. Um, so that that is really quite different. But the changing the germline, which is uh, changing the, right. the very programming, that could kill everybody in ten yeah. generations. Right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, there there are vast differences here in those, but I I think it's extremely uh, promising, you know, the, the yeah. work on this, no doubt. And it goes beyond healthcare, of course, because if you think about, you know, the whole economy, uh, almost half of what we consume, um, you know, with fossil fuels, all the food that we have, of course, all the pharmaceuticals and so on, um, but also a lot of our clothes, it all comes from products that are derived from natural plants, you know, from, from natural environment. And so uh, this notion of, of programmable biology extends way beha way past uh, healthcare. But even healthcare alone is now you know 20 20 some percent of the economy. Uh, and I know understand that um, outside the United States, Switzerland has the second highest spending uh, per capita on healthcare. So clearly, it's something that the two countries share. Uh, area that yeah. could be you know that money could be better spent. I think it's not necessarily the most efficient spend. Um, you mentioned some other technologies before the break, and I want to make sure we cover those off because we had to go to our lightning round. One of the topics you brought up was mm -hmm. cognitive computing. Uh, so there's been tremendous advances recently in particular uh, in machine learning. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on that technology. How is it going to influence the world? I mean, I, I, I think really what we're seeing now is, is tremendous progress in uh, what I call IA, intelligent assistance. Uh, that means that computers are no longer that stupid. They're still pretty stupid to a large degree, but they're not stupid like they were 10 years ago. Uh, so they can actually do things like learn patterns, understand things. Right? They do not have human level understanding because human level understanding involves the real world. <laughs> Right, and we have uh, emotional intelligence, kinesthetic intelligence, social intelligence. You know, that's that's a human-only thing, in my view. But machines have this kind of binary intelligence, which is getting very useful. Right. So my view is that most routine commodity tasks will eventually be done by machines mm -hmm. if they don't involve uh, human intelligence. You know, for example, uh, financial right. portfolio management, uh, radiology. Uh, things like that, but it will Accounting. not make the humans, uh, it will not get rid of the humans because we still need the other stuff that only we can do, uh, the fuzzy logic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the machine learning, the deep learning is often confused with human learning, which is completely different. Uh, it is basically binary, but endless. And we are multinary, but ending, you know, we don't have it's the opposite of us. So I always say the future really is awesome awesome humans on top of amazing technology um, so that we can use these tools, for example, to finally work less. Uh, or better. And to or, bring down or, the costs of healthcare, right? Better, yeah. right? Or achieve better so, results. I mean, this is very... Yeah, it's extremely hopeful that we can imagine that if we can make healthcare really cheap, Mm -hmm. And people don't go to the hospital or the doctor for every little thing that they have. And, and they can monitor themselves and get smart about what they do. Yeah, that should shave off like 50% of the cost, right? Yeah, at least. Speaking. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, this as, is... As long as we don't cut out people. Well, also just getting better at diagnostics. Uh, you know, obviously, if you look at um, maladies like cancer and things like that, the ability to diagnose those you know, early is very important. Um, you know, AI is obviously having huge uh, improvements there yeah. um in 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 terms of the way healthcare might evolve um it appears to me and i'll just get your thoughts on this that you know we're probably going to end up with something like a, you know because it's going to be a data 
um, driven service w- would best be sort of in in a maintenance mode, sort of a subscription based service where you've got your, you know, genome analytics, you know, blood work, gut biome, your behavior, your diet, all of that sort of mixed into some sort of model um, where we we look at individualizing um, treatment and and so forth. How how do you think um, the industrial element of healthcare is going to evolve in the future? Well, I mean, uh, first, of course, there is complete convergence coming up of uh, of info technology, information technology, and biotechnology, right? Um, and we're going from the, the idea of what we have right now, which is what I call sick care. You know, we're taking care of sick people, giving them pills, right, right, uh, which is very costly, doesn't do anything, uh, to the idea of healthcare, which is to prevent right. stuff and to cure and to heal and to use technology and not some voodoo pill, you know, that that is going to end up, you know, 400 million people take statins, you know, for for cholesterol, right? And, and it, they don't do anything. And so, uh, so there's all these things that are changing here. And I think the biggest challenge will be the question of, you know, if we don't share the data in the cloud so we can compute, right? then it's going to be hard to get the intelligence. Right? And so what we're going to see the healthcare companies do is probably establish a sort of independent uh, depository of information that's in the cloud that can't be run by one company. It has to be sort of a public utility of a sort, you know, that safeguards and yeah. dishes out my data. Uh, without that, I don't see progress because, you know, we have once we have 5 billion genomes in the cloud, you know, imagine the kind of intelligence we can get from this. But on the other hand, it has to be safeguarded, right? And this is a very big topic in Europe. Nobody will do that until we find out how exactly we would actually be safe. You brought up two topics there that I really want to drive deeper into uh, European regulation and and basically the Europeans preventing themselves from innovating. But let's bookmark that. I want to come back to that <laughs> because I want to talk about something you mentioned. You said that the healthcare companies are the ones that are going to lead this infotech revolution. I want to push back on that a little bit. Uh, a couple of years ago, I spent time in Brazil with um, one of the big pharma companies there. And I pointed out to them that their basic business model is selling better life through chemistry, right? Better living through chemistry. They are chemical companies. They just dispense it in a form uh, where we, you know, we pop these pills. Uh, then pills don't do nothing, uh, but they do. They do not necessarily solve the problem, right? Because the business model of pharma is to put you on a lifestyle drug that you're going to take for the rest of your life. And right. literally hundreds of millions of people around the world are on that program. Uh, you know, here in the US, pills are prescribed for all sorts of things, but they're never, you're never told to unsubscribe from those pills. So this idea of subscription pharma has been a very big business model. It's one of the reasons why the pharma companies don't get into things that actually cure you like antibiotics. There's less investment there because it's not as good as a business model. Uh, if you cure the patient, they stop buying your pills. So right. you have pharma companies. You could that argue are, that's why we don't have cures for cancer, right? So pharma companies are hooked on this business model of subscription uh, lifestyle medicines. The companies that are focused on information as a substitute are not pharma companies. Those are the big tech companies. And it's no surprise then to see that Google, Microsoft, Amazon and Apple have enormous healthcare initiatives. And the point of those initiatives is prevention. Basically, they want to use information as a substitute for chemicals or information as a substitute for healthcare services. The idea being, if you can get people information sooner about what they might do to prevent a problem, then you you kind of keep them to the left, you know, before they even go into that healthcare or what you call the the sick care system, right? Um, Before people get sick, if you can keep them healthy longer by giving them intelligent reminders. You know, the reason I love this Apple Watch, for instance, not just because uh, Apple dominated Switzerland in the terms of the watch business, but because it actually gives me constant updates on how I'm doing uh, and constant reminders to do things like breathe or move or step, uh, stand up and so forth. And you can manage those notifications. But the point is that Apple's helping me do something proactive about my health. Uh, there's no healthcare company involved. There's no insurance company involved. And there's certainly no pharma company involved. And candidly, I'd rather not deal with those companies. So this represents then an existential threat for the pharma companies, because if the tech companies are successful in using health, it's all about the data, using data as a way to prevent people from using more healthcare services, then that means they're going to sell less meta, they're going to sell less chemicals, they're going to sell less pills in the future. How does that look from a uh, from a European perspective? What do you what is your take on that? Because there is a huge data problem there, as you described. 
Not only that, but we're going, you know, we're going to have to design medicine to be much more personalized as well. Right. So there's sort of mass pay. Even before we get to that, though, Brett, that's 10 years down the road. What I'm talking about is happening right now. Right. Using information as a substitute for pills. Uh, that's a real problem. Yeah, I think the, companies. Uh, the, this whole process will kind of be like the other innovation processes. Uh, the really big shifts are almost never done by the ones who are currently in the business. Yeah. Right? yeah. So Spotify versus record labels, right? Netflix versus the studios, uh, Uber versus the car business, same story, right? So what we're going to see here uh, with one big difference being is that healthcare is primarily paid in, in Europe by the state, right? So, so the state has a big role there. So that, that's a, a one equalizing factor there. But yeah. we're going to see huge innovation coming from companies that have no current business in healthcare or very little or different. And that's going to frighten those guys like Genentech, for example, has an investment from Roche, right? And Human Longevity Inc. is owned by Genentech and so on and so on, right? So that's already happening. So uh, the big pharma companies are looking at this and saying, okay, what's happening here is totally clear. They're going to eat our lunch if we don't make deals, if we don't. And 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 the government's also saying, you guys need to be better and cheaper. Um, so we're going to see a slightly different thing here uh, than we've seen in the past. We're going to have probably more productivity from the big pharma companies um that i'm seeing here in europe also because it's the government that needs to tell people it's okay to give your data right? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, That's true. And, and and in america it's all voluntary and you know we give our data to facebook and they can screw with us no matter which way they want and there's no um, law and there's no one who's going to protect you <laughs> <laughs> right but you know here in europe is i mean basically this is already happening in brussels there's already entities yeah. that are preparing a data depository with the secure ID and all that stuff that's run by the government, run like a like a bank, basically. Mm-hmm. Run. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a central bank digital currency and we have a central pharma, you know, DNA bank in the same way. Yeah. And that is government business, right? So yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of a big revolution there. And, and I, I, not, I, do, I generally okay. think that regulation is going to have to become a lot more data driven um you know if you look at money laundering and and you know it, there's got to be a data exercise you know the the suspicious transaction reporting and all the stuff we do for um you know um you know money laundering tackling now it's woefully ineffective and it now you, if you look at things like artificial intelligence and regulation around that and the data sharing for healthcare because obviously as you said you talked about the 5 billion genomes you know as as an illustration this requires data sharing do you think that part of this um it, it is an epiphany that we need to have that privacy is not as important as the shareability of data as long as it's done right uh well most europeans wouldn't agree on on that part i, I, think, I, know. I think yeah what we, what, we, what we need to have is a, a safe and supervised way of doing this that does the same thing mm-hmm. but doesn't open us up to the facebook type syndromes you know mm-hmm. uh because facebook knows more about us than the nsa and in fact they probably work with the nsa on, on getting that information to them yeah as has been documented uh, so if I'm going to put my genome in the cloud because it may prevent me getting diabetes and stuff, that's a good motivation. I'm going to want to make damn sure that there's public supervision and rights and risks, uh, you know, and all that stuff can't be done by, say, IBM. You know, it, that that wouldn't be enough. So that's so a very, very something there. You know? OK, I hear you, Brett, Garrett. That's a very European perspective from my view. So sitting here in the United States, I would say most Americans don't care about privacy. We say we do. We talk about it. It's in the press. People, politicians talk about it all the time, but we don't do anything to protect our privacy. And on this show previously, we've we've broken it down like this. You've got sort of three different uh, approaches that seem to be playing out simultaneously. In China, you have this kind of autocratic approach where the government issues very stern decrees and, and business must conform. Um, and in fact, if business doesn't conform, the penalties are swift and severe and personal to the executives. Uh, mm-hmm. So China has a exerting is exerting total control over the tech sector. And China's also the Chinese government is exerting control over all the data. Uh, they collect all the data. Um, then you have the European approach, which is to focus on individual privacy. Uh, 
uh, initiatives like GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations. Um, and then in the United States, you have kind of a laissez-faire approach, which is very typical of the U.S., where we're saying, you know, we're going to let this unfold. We're not going to really, the government's not going to get in the way. Let's see how business But government it. does get in the way all the time for sure. protecting sure, sure. the it's existing not perfect. interest. No, no, and I'm not trying to say that's a perfect breakdown, what I've given you. Of course, there's a there's a blending uh, and there's more regulatory initiatives happening under the current uh, administration in the U.S. That that's certainly the case, but I think that general generalization holds to some extent. Europeans are very focused on privacy. They're for good reason, good historical reason. They're very skeptical of governments managing this, um, and centralizing it in the government. But they're also leery of businesses like the United, particularly the U.S. tech companies, which effectively have been pillaging European data for 20 years now and collecting huge amounts of it. Um, but both of them are kind of like a, uh, the opposite of the Chinese approach, which is to centralize everything and manage it from the central government. My observation is that um, there are very few examples of successful European tech companies. And I wonder if that's a result of the regulatory environment. It's hard to name a really successful European tech company uh, with the ex exception uh, of maybe SAP. You know? <laughs> Them's fighting words, dude. <laughs> well, I mean, it, regulation does have an impact, yeah. right? You're going to allocate resources with the private market or through government regulation. And in Europe, it's clear they're focused on, on government regulation doing that allocation. And, it's, and it seems to have prevented... Well, I think, they, I think the, the primary reason is, is really that, you know, we are a conglomeration of different countries and languages and customs, right. and we don't have big markets. Uh, so, like you know, for example, yeah. as a futurist in, in in Europe, I have to cover each country in a different language, uh, and and what I do there is different in each country. In America, if you're a futurist and you go on the CBS Good Morning Show, everybody watches that, everybody knows you. We don't have this kind of thing here. You know, you can reach an audience and you can sell like you know, if you sell books in in Europe, you sell ten thousand books, it's amazing, right? And in America, you wouldn't even yeah. talk if it wasn't five hundred thousand, right? Yeah, yeah. So. And this is the same reason why those companies are lagging, right? However, all of the great researchers from EPFL and ETH, which is right down the street, the, the biggest university here in Zurich, they all end up going to Silicon Valley and driving things there or mm -hmm. to China. So there's an indirect influence there. And I would I would say that generally the European perspective on uh, you know making a deal between security and freedom, you could say, in a way, with the data is is probably quite well balanced, but the execution is awful, and it smells of bureaucracy and 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 all of that kind of stuff, right? But the opposite is in in the U.S. You know, it smells out of it smells of selling out, right? right? Um, and 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 that is also not good. I mean, if you if you see what's happening in social media, if we have a disaster like this in healthcare. Right. Yeah. It's it's right. no. We don't want that. You know. We don't want our DNA to go out like Facebook has shared our user data. Uh, you 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 good. You you talk about this approach. You know, different countries in Europe with the different languages and so forth. Um, as a futurist, coaching these types of organizations, you know, in the US versus Europe, um, you know, do you adopt a different style as a futurist in terms of helping, you know, organizations being future ready, depending on where it is geographically? Yes. I mean, I think that you, ha you have to probably be more sensible in many ways in Europe. Americans uh, in general like a great story. You know, the culture in America is forward looking, it's future focused, it's visionary, it's entrepreneurial at all costs, right? And, and and sometimes you can laugh about that, but I lived there 17 years and I'm like, you have to admire it, right? Then you come to Germany where it's the opposite, right? If you have this kind of culture in Germany, people will say, you know, uh, it's one of those nut cases that's going to be either very successful or die, right? Um, and so my approach to when I speak in Germany is completely different than when I speak uh, mm -hmm. in the US. And I don't speak in Germany very much for that reason. People think of me in many ways as an American. Oh, um, interesting. That's interesting. Because well, that's you're future because, focused. Because my, yeah. Yeah, because my work is in English and I lived there a long time. And, you know, even Germans think of me as an American in many ways, uh, also because of my the way that I present. And yet the, the Swiss think of you as German. Is that win, right? So is yeah. that an advantage or a disadvantage for you? Like to be perceived that way? Is that it does that help? Do do people take you more seriously or do they resist it? I think I get more of a wild card. 
because of this. Uh, when I speak in America or in Brazil or Colombia, people think of me as sort of half American, half European, which is a great advantage. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, so I'm, I'm not as as over the moon as uh, Michio Kaku. Um, you know, brilliant guy, but definitely out there, right? He is uh, out there. In terms of what he says. And, you know, he's, I, I love I love him, but I think for many audiences, it's quite a stretch, right? Yeah. Um, and I can bring the European sensibility to that. And when I speak in Germany, I can speak a little bit like I came half out, out of Silicon Valley. And that is also a great advantage. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm quite happy with the position. And, you know, that's basically what I do. Well, well, can you give us an example of a company where you've given them advice that they've implemented? Um, I know you probably can't talk about confidential things, but maybe you can make a, a general uh, statement. You're like, what kind of industry is your advice really going to resonate in? You know, I think uh, I think of this sometimes like therapy. You know, when you go to a therapist, and the, sometimes I jokingly call the work future therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to a therapist, you know, the therapist does not give you an instant solution. He tries to figure out a way for you to discover yourself what the solution is mm -hmm. by, by bringing up the painful points with you and your wife or whatever reason you're going. You're not right? the only one to bring that um, up. We, we had a call with uh, Rohit Talwar, who said something very similar. Right. He, he talked about the psychology of being a futurist and and how uh, you have to have a lot of social skill and a yeah, lot of yeah. like, you know, kind of armchair psychology insight in order to persuade and kind of cajole the group to kind of come along with you, but it's an invitation. You're not you're not preaching at them. You're inviting them to join you. Um, okay, let's yeah, let's I think, look I think at the future. Just just as an, yeah, sure. as, as an example, you know, I I, I uh, kind of coached parenthesis, a, a big Swiss uh, insurance company, into responsibility for for supporting environmentally bad activities. Right, right, right. So, so I said, look, if you guys are really into sustainability and you want to change the world there, then don't insure the coal plant. Yes. Right? Yeah. And and so they did. Oh, you know, they stopped doing awesome. it. Awesome. I think they had other they had other reasons, but uh, I think, but it finally landed at some crucial point. Uh, Impressive. Uh, you know, to where they made that decision, nice. and, and that has happened a bunch of times, like with the major TV studios. I kind of egged them on a little bit towards opening up the licensing procedure and things like that. So sometimes a good therapist can, you know, move the needle. Get them to take awesome. action. That's great. Uh, and that fits with your tech versus humanity th thesis, right? It's uh, it's consistent with what you've been writing about. So it's nice to see you're able to put that into action. We like people who put things into action on this show. That's that's great. Okay, let's let's okay. now let's like take a look at the f far future. So this is the part of the show. Big where, picture stuff. Yeah, go way out there. Tell us ten years, like 30, 50 years out. You know what what do you what do you perceive the world is going to be like? Um, you know what do you think will have changed uh, hum the human species as a humanist? Um, you know, t tell us about your vision for the future in terms of you know what 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 you like about it what it, what it, what makes you optimistic <laughs> well you know the reason that i have this good future topic is because i believe the next five to ten years in many ways the the shit is going to hit the fan so to speak uh which means climate and serious action there uh automation jobs ai uh, right that's going to be heaven or hell so to speak right uh social justice inequality north south the climate coin that uh, uh, he, uh, that uh, Kim Stanley Robertson yeah, talks about. Yeah, I like about. that idea. I believe, I believe that basically we have ten years to get our stuff together, and we will, because it, I think it has been proven that uh, humans are basically capable of emergency action. You know, in the COVID yes. crisis, for example, <laughs> right? We just have to get enough pain, so we're exactly. going to get a lot of pain. Uh, and we're going to, you know, we'll say all this bad weather patterns and, you know, the food problem and all that stuff. There's going to be so much pain that catalyzes people into action. And then the best thing, of course, is the millennials are coming, the kids between 25 and 40. And they're saying, I've had enough of this stuff. You know, I'm yes. going to get elected. Right? And women are coming. Uh, and so they're going to take over in decision making from us, basically, in, in the political sense, right? And this paradigm shift is going to play out the next ten years. And if it if it goes according to that, I think we're going to harvest technology to actually solve most of our practical practical problems: water, food, disease, all of those things. Right? And it could be a kind of golden era, like a, 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 a bell epoch, you know, in in starting in five years, if all that comes together, 
but the pain to get there will be huge because you know we're talking about a hundred fifty yeah. trillion dollar value shift from the fossil fuel to the green economy. Right. Uh, so lots of pain, lots of upheaval, upheaval, lots of chaos in the next ten years, but potentially an outlook of a protopia society, as Kevin Kelly says, uh, a, a slowly improving march towards the good future. Um, that's my positive view. I think that it's quite likely that we can make that happen. Hashtag optimal humanity. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Well, good. And, this has been fascinating. Yeah. Where can people find yeah, out I, more I, about about you and and uh, the Good Future Project and and everything else that you're working on? Yeah, so my website is Futurist Gerd G E R D, like gastrointestinal reflux disease. Same thing, right? Uh, Futuristgerd dot com. Don't look for Gerd; you'll find other other stuff first. And my book is at uh, Tech versus Human dot com. It's my last book, and my YouTube channel Gerd Tube. Here it is. I'm gonna put it in here. Right, with awesome. the tool here, <laughs> gertube.com, right? And uh, that's where the stuff is. The Good Future has a bunch of websites. So the goodfuturefilm.com, it's a free to watch on YouTube if you just look for that. And the project officially launching in two weeks, the goodfutureproject.com is already up and running and already has 50 members and supporters, including Corey Doctoroff and, uh, and a bunch of other really interesting people. Awesome. Well, nice. great fun, great fun to catch up with you, Garrett. I'm very happy to see you thriving in this post pandemic time. Thank you. Same here. Well, that's it for the futurists this week. Thanks for joining us. If you liked what you heard, uh, make sure to leave us a review on social media or, um, you know, tweet it out, uh, put it on uh, LinkedIn, wherever it is you consume or watch social media and, uh, you know, let others, let others know about the show. It helps people find it. And, and also, um, you know, tell us what you'd like to hear, who, who you, you would like us to interview on the show. And we'll, uh, we'll try and get onto that. I still think we need to get Kim Stanley Robinson on even more so after our conversation today i talk about it almost every week don't i Rob? <laughs> um, but we will get there we will get there but um, like the great white whale and moby dick you're gonna get absolutely that one. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but uh yeah thanks our thanks go out to the production team to elizabeth severance uh, kevin hersham uh, sylvie johnson carlo navarro who help us on the social media side as well and the team at provoke that helps us put this uh, together but uh, join us next week we're going to um, have a more interesting uh, discussions i think ram is nam is coming up next week so um it'll be uh, be another great show thanks for joining us on the futurists and we'll see you next week in fact we'll see you in the future in the future <laughs> <laughs> well that's it for the futurists this week if you like the show we sure hope you did please subscribe and share it with the people in your community and don't forget to leave us a five-star review that really helps other people find the show. And you can ping us anytime on Instagram and Twitter at, at Futurist Podcast for the folks that you'd like to see on the show or the questions that you'd like us to ask. Thanks for joining. And as always, we'll see you in the future.